Okay, we're going to talk about proofreading and repairing DNA, but I have to make a little disclaimer that I'm in my daughter's toy room right now, so if you hear any strange noises, that's probably why. So, once DNA is replicated, uh, there's an enzyme, or a group of enzymes, called DNA polymerases, and they proofread the newly made DNA, and they're going to replace any incorrect nucleoti nucleotides. So, in a mismatched pair of DNA, repair enzymes will correct the errors, uh, DNA can also be damaged by things like exposure to harmful chemicals or physical agents, like we're talking about cigarettes, um, x-rays, UV lights, and also it can undergo spontaneous changes. Nora Mac, I need you to make no noise whatsoever, honey. Please be quiet. In nucleotide excision repair, there's a nuclease that cuts out and replaces damaged stretches of DNA. So... Um, this is showing you a picture of DNA that is mismatched. You can see that it's been mismatched here by the... <laughs> yes, Nora, you can see. You, you can see that it's mismatched because up here in the top, it doesn't create a straight ladder. It, there's a bump here. So what happens is that the... Um, huh? What happens is that the nuclease comes in and it will cut out the portion that's incorrect. So you can see that it did that. And then the polymerase, Nora Mac, I need you to not speak. The polymerase comes in and it binds the proper DNA so that the, everything is bound up. Altered DNA has different effects in terms of evolutionary significance. So first of all, the error rate after proofreading repair is very low, but it's not zero. So sometimes sequence changes can become permanent and then can be passed on to the next generation. So we refer to these changes as mutations, and they're the source of genetic variation upon which natural selection can act or operate. There are also limitations uh, of DNA polymerases. Uh, they, it can create problems for the linear DNA of the eukaryotic chromosomes. Usually, uh, the replication machinery will provide no way to complete the five prime ends. So repeat. <laughs> Nora, please, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, the if the usual replication machinery provides Nora, please be quiet. Provides no way to complete the five prime ends. The repeated rounds the the process of replication happening over and over again will produce shorter DNA molecules that have uneven ends. So for prokaryotes, this usually doesn't come into play because they have circular chromosomes, they don't have an end. So as you can see here, the daughter molecules get shorter and shorter by the end of the, um, by the end of the, the more successive rounds of replication, the shorter the daughter molecules get. So because of this, eukaryotic chromosomes have special nucleotide sequences at their end called telomeres. Some people pronounce this telomeres. But the telomere, I'm about to tell you what a telomere is, Nora. Um, they are the sequences at the end of the DNA that, although they don't prevent the shortening of the DNA molecules, they can postpone the erosion of genes that are near the ends of the DNA molecules. And sometimes... Uh, or many scientists believe that the shortening of these telomeres is connected Mommy, to aging. So, um, these Mommy are blues. those are chromosomes, and the colorful spots on them are the telomeres. What the telomere do? I I already told you, honey. Just listen. If chromosomes of germ cells become shorter in every cell cycle, then essential genes would eventually be missing from the gametes they produce. So, germ cells are the cells that turn into Mommy, gametes. So an enzyme called um, telomerase will catalyze the lengthening of the telomeres in germ cells. So even though the shortening of telomeres might protect cells from cancerous growth by limiting, well, they limit the number of cell divisions, there is also evidence of tel um, tel telomerase. I have such a that word activity in cancer cells, which sometimes allows cancer to persist. Okay, so the chromosomes, when we discussed chromosomes, we're actually talking about DNA that has been packed together with proteins. And a bacterial chromosome is always double-stranded, and it's always circular, and it's associated with a relatively small amount of protein. Eukaryotic chromosomes, on the other hand, are very linear, and 
therefore there are larger amounts of proteins that are associated with them. In a bacterium, the DNA is what we call supercoiled, and it's found in a region of the cell called the nucleoid. Chromatin, which is a complex of DNA and protein, is found in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. So chromosomes fit into the nucleus through a multi-level, very elaborate system of packing around these proteins. So the histones here are the proteins that the DNA gets wrapped around. So as you can see, the DNA gets wrapped around the histones, and then the histones kind of wrap around themselves so that the DNA is very, very elaborately, elaborately coiled. So you can see here how those histones and the DNA coils relate to the portions that make up your chromosomes and your chromatids. So if you look at the, um, if you look at this diagram here, a 30 nanometer fiber, so it's 30 nanometers wide, will loop into each other to form a 300 nanometer fiber, and then those fibers will loop to form a replicated chromosome, which is 1,400 nanometers across. Mommy, that's a lot. It is a lot, honey. Chromosome, I'm sorry, chromatin will undergo changes in packing during the cell cycle. So in interphase, some of the chromatin is organized into a 10 nanometer fiber, but um, much of it is compacted into 30 nanometer fibers um, with the folding and all the looping that occurs. So. Um, although interface chromosomes are not highly condensed, they still occupy specific regions within the nucleus, and um, that's why we can take our chromosomes and put them into a karyotype uh, once the cell starts to divide. So if you look here, you can see a relationship down here in this nucleus, um, and the colors roughly correspond to what they would look like uh, up here in your karyotype. So most of the chromatin is going to be loosely packed in the nucleus during interphase and will condense just prior to mitosis. During interphase, a few regions of the chromatins are going to be very highly condensed, and the dense packing makes it very difficult for the cell to express the genetic information that's coded within those regions. So histones can then undergo certain chemical modifications, and those result in how or they result in changes in how the chromatin is organized. Now, this becomes a big deal when we're talking about gene expression and epigenetics. So, I apologize for all of the interruptions today, um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about gene expression in the next chapter.